We're now going to take a look at a rather interesting function called the Euler totient function. We've seen that if we have two functions that are multiplicative, their product is multiplicative and their convolution is multiplicative. Specifically, summatory and anti-summatory functions of multiplicative functions are also multiplicative. So we can expand our library of multiplicative functions using these tricks. Let's consider the function f of n is n to the alpha. That's a completely multiplicative function. It's one of the very first ones we introduced in this whole unit. So therefore, its summatory function must be multiplicative. The summatory function would just go along the factors of n and add them up to the alpha power because I'm plugging those factors into this function, raised to the alpha power, and then adding it up. So this is very similar to the function sigma of n, which adds up the factors of a number. Here, we're adding them up to the alpha power. So if I want to sum up the alpha powers of positive factors of n, I'm going to denote that as sigma of n, but with a subscript alpha to notate the fact that I'm taking these alpha powers. However, there are two exceptions. If alpha is one, then I would be simply raising all of the factors to the first power, in other words, not changing them. So I'm just adding up the positive factors and we've already called that sigma of n. So sigma sub one would just be redundant. That's already called sigma. But also, suppose you raise all of the factors to the zero power. So now, instead of a list of positive factors, I've replaced this list with a bunch of ones, and then I add that up. This is a neat combinatorial trick that's equivalent to counting how many things were in the list. Suppose I have a list of objects, and then instead of counting them, I replace them all with the number one and then add up how many ones I have. That's just counting how many things were in the list to begin with. So if I replace all the positive factors of n with n to the zero, I have, uh, sorry, the factor to the zero, I have then replaced every factor with the number one, and when I add that up, I've simply counted how many positive factors there are, and that's exactly the function tau. So sigma with a subscript of zero would be redundant with the tau function, counting how many positive factors there are. In practice, the only other version of this sigma function that actually shows up a lot is sigma sub two, adding up the squares of the positive factors. I'm not saying adding up other powers of factors couldn't possibly arise. I'm just saying they seem a bit artificial. Sigma sub one, in other words, the normal sigma function, that pops up. Sigma sub zero, the tau function, that shows up a lot. Sigma sub two has arisen from time to time in natural contexts. Other than that, I've never really seen them show up. We can compute their values, we can assign problems with them, but they're not necessarily useful outside of exercises. Now we're going to define a new function. For any n bigger than or equal to one, we define the Euler totient function, and we use this symbol here. This is the Greek letter phi. In the UK, it's pronounced phi. In Greece, it's pronounced phi, and in the US, we pronounce it phi. So this is phi of n and we compute it as, out of the numbers one through n, how many of them are relatively prime to n? So you list out all the numbers one through n and ask how many are relatively prime to that number n, and however many that is, that's the value phi of n. So let's work through computing the value phi of n, phi of one, phi of two, all the way up to phi of 12. So here I've made a table where I've preemptively filled in not just the numbers one through 12, but for each number I've listed out one through n. So one and two, one through three, one through four, one through five, and so forth. So now out of the list, which satisfy that they are relatively prime to n? Well, one is relatively prime to one. One is relatively prime to two, but two is not. 1 is relatively prime to, to 3, and 2 is relatively prime to 3, but 3 is not. 1 and 3 are relatively prime to 4, but 2 and 4 are not. 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all relatively prime to 5, but 5 isn't. 1 and 5 are relatively prime to 6, but not 2, 3, 4, or 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are all relatively prime to 7, but 7 isn't. 1, 3, 5, and 7 are relatively prime to 8. 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, and 8 are relatively prime to 9. 1, 3, 7, and 9 are relatively prime to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are all relatively prime to 11. 1, 
5, 7, and 11 are relatively prime to 12, but not 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, or 12. So to compute the value phi of n, we just ask how many numbers did we count? One of them, one of them, two of them, two of them, four of them, two of them, six of them, four of them, six of them, four of them, ten of them, and four of them. So phi of one is one, phi of two is one. Phi of three, there were two numbers in this list relatively prime to three, so phi of three is two. Let's take a look at five. Out of the list of numbers one through five, these numbers were relatively prime to five. There were four numbers in that list, so phi of five is four. Jumping ahead to eight, out of the list one through eight, only the numbers one through five, one, three, five, and seven are relatively prime to eight. That's a total of four numbers, so phi of eight is four, and so forth. Of course, on the previous slide, we sort of manually computed values of the euler totian function, but what if someone asks, what's phi of 28,000? You really don't want to have to list out all the numbers 1 through 28,000 and start checking which are relatively prime to 28,000. However, the euler totian function is multiplicative, which means if we can figure out how it evaluates prime powers, then we're done. Now, as far as a proof of the fact that the euler totian function is multiplicative, we're going to omit that proof for now. Later on in this video, I'll illustrate the steps for a kind of non-standard and I think very interesting proof that the euler totian function is multiplicative that we could complete using everything we know at this moment. The typical proof, however, is pretty short, but it uses something known as the Chinese remainder theorem, which we haven't yet developed. Since we don't have the Chinese remainder theorem in our arsenal yet, we're gonna hold off proving that the euler totian function is multiplicative. I don't want to rely on something I haven't proved. That would be pretty circular reasoning. So for the moment, we're simply going to take it as a given that the euler totian function is multiplicative so that we can develop a formula for computing its values. We will revisit this fact later on. So since phi is now given to be multiplicative, if I want to know how it evaluates anything, I only need to know how it evaluates prime powers. So we're going to show that phi of p to the k is given by p minus 1 times p to the k minus 1. Now, if you've been paying attention and you remember the last video, you might recognize this. So let's go ahead and compute phi of p to the k. So list out all the integers 1 through p to the k. What we have to do is remove the numbers that are not relatively prime to p to the k so that we can then count how many are. What numbers are going to not be relatively prime to p to the k? Now, the only prime factor of p to the k is p itself. So the only numbers that are not relatively prime to p to the k are those numbers that are also divisible by p. In other words, all the multiples of p. So we remove from the list 1 through p to the k the multiples of p, p times 1, p times 2, p times 3, and so forth. However, we don't want to remove values that aren't in the list. So we're removing multiples of p until we reach the end of the list, p to the k. But this is also a multiple of p. It's p times p to the k minus 1. So from the list, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to p to the k, remove p, remove 2p. That's the second number we removed, is 2 times p. Remove 3p. 3 times p is the third number we removed. 4 times p is the fourth number we removed. And the last number we removed is p times p to the k minus 1. So we removed exactly p to the k minus 1 of them. The number we are multiplying p by tells us exactly how many we have removed so far. p times 1 was the first, and then p times 2 was the second, so we've removed 2. p times 3, we've now removed 3. So at the very end, p times p to the k minus 1, we have removed p time to the k minus 1 of them. So phi of p to the k is how many numbers in the list did we not remove? The entire list had p to the k. We then took away, quite literally, p to the k minus 1 of them, and I can factor p minus 1 times p to the k minus 1. So therefore, of the list 1 through p to the k, exactly this many of them are relatively prime to p to the k. So phi of p to the k is given by p minus 1 times p to the k minus 1. Now we're going to establish a pretty nice identity. 
The summatory function of the totient function is this very straightforward function, capital F of n equals n. In fact, we already proved this in the previous video, Mobius inversion. We found that the anti-summatory function of this function here is something which is multiplicative and evaluates prime powers like this. But hey, the totient function is a multiplicative function and it evaluates prime powers like this. If this f is multiplicative and phi is multiplicative and they compute prime powers the same way, well then they compute everything the same way and they are the same function. But we're actually just going to prove this again. We're going to directly compute the summatory function of the totient function because it is a good exercise. Well, since phi is multiplicative, its summatory function is as well, so we only need to know how it acts on prime powers. So let's compute capital F of p to the k. We take all the positive factors of p to the k and we plug them into the function we're taking the summatory function of, which was the totient function. So phi of 1, phi of p, all the way up to phi of p to the k. Phi of 1 is 1. Okay, out of the list of the numbers 1 through 1, how many were relatively prime to 1? One of them. Phi of p is p minus 1. This satisfies the fact that phi of p to the k is p minus 1 times p to the k minus 1. So here I have p minus 1 times p to the 0. Okay, if this power is 1, here I would have p to the 0. Phi of p squared is going to be p minus 1 times p to the first. Phi of p cubed is going to be p minus 1 times p squared, all the way until I get to phi of p to the k is p minus 1 times p to the k minus 1. Other than the initial term of 1, everything else has a common factor of p minus 1, leaving behind 1 plus p plus p squared all the way to p to the k minus 1. But this is a partial geometric sum that has the following formula. The next power of p minus 1 over p minus 1, and now these cancel out, leaving just p to the k. So capital F is now a multiplicative function, and when you plug in a prime power, you just get exactly that prime power back out. So since it's a multiplicative function which does nothing to prime powers, it doesn't actually change the value of anything. It is, in fact, capital F of n equals n for all numbers n. Now let's revisit this notion that the totient function is multiplicative. As I said before, we're going to quickly prove that the totient function is multiplicative once we have the Chinese remainder theorem at our disposal. If you're interested, however, it is possible to prove the totient function is multiplicative just through the definition. It's a longer proof than the Chinese remainder theorem one, but it is an interesting challenge, and I think it's a rather interesting proof. Here are a possible list of steps to accomplish this goal. First, establish that phi of n is n minus 1 if and only if n is prime. Next, show that phi of n to the k is n to the k minus 1 times phi of n for any number n, whether n is prime or not, show that this identity holds. Next, if phi is prime and is a factor of n, then phi of pn is p times phi of n. So prime numbers can be factored out provided p is a factor of what you're leaving behind. So if what you leave behind in the euler totient function is still got a factor of p in it, then you can factor this p out. Next, if p is prime and not a factor of n, then if you attempt to factor p out of the totient function, it becomes p minus 1. Five, you can use all the previous steps to show that phi is in fact multiplicative. Now, even if you can't prove every single step here, all five of them, try to see how the pieces fit. So maybe you couldn't prove steps two or three, but you could prove step one. Can you then see that if you assume step two and three hold, and you use the fact you proved step one, does that help you prove step four? Or if you assume step four, can you then prove step five, and so forth? Try to work through seeing how these individual pieces, one, two, three, and four, get you to the end of step five. Let's look at an example involving the totient function. Again, using the fact that phi is multiplicative, how many integers between one and 200 are relatively prime to 200? Well, that's just asking us to compute phi of 200. Now, 200 has a pretty straightforward prime factorization, and phi is multiplicative. So, phi of p to the k is p minus 1 times p to the k minus 1, and we're going to apply this to the factorization of 200. 
phi of 200 is just going to be phi of 2 cubed times phi of 5 squared. The prime is 2, the power is 3, p minus 1 times p to the k minus 1. The prime is 5, the power is 2, p minus 1 times p to the k minus 1, and ultimately this is 80. So in the list of numbers 1 to 200, 80 of them are relatively prime to 200. However, if you ask the question, between 1 and 200, how many of those numbers are relatively prime to 300, the totient function does not help. You have to be listing out 1 through n and asking how many numbers are relatively prime to n. Also, the totient function does not tell us which numbers in the list are relatively prime to the target value. So in the example we did above, we know that 80 numbers between 1 and 200 are relatively prime to 200, but I really have no idea which numbers they are. I just know there are 80 of them. So the totient function is a very nice and straightforward way to compute how many values between 1 and n are relatively prime to n but it doesn't tell you what numbers those are, and therefore it doesn't help you tell, uh, compute which numbers between 1 and n are relatively prime to something else.